Hi, how's it going? For years now, I've been putting the output of cheap welders to the test. I'm starting to see others do the same, and I think that's pretty cool. But just like the welders we're testing, the clamp meters for testing amperage also come in a wide range of prices, and you can get some super cheap ones from places like Amazon. I thought I'd put a handful of meters to the test to see how their readings compare. I wanted to see if there's a meaningful difference based on price for the type of testing I typically do in my videos. Things got a little out of hand. I have here a selection of some of the very cheapest clamp meters that I could find that are capable of reading DC amperage, since most welders these days have DC output. I also have a selection of meters at various price levels going up from there. And I got distracted by another aspect of these meters and went down a bit of a rabbit hole. So before I get to testing, I want to talk about safety and the voltage category or CAT rating on meters. A 600 volt CAT3 rating doesn't only tell you that the maximum safe working voltage is 600 volts. It tells you that, but a 600 volt CAT3 rating should also indicate that a meter can withstand up to 6,000 volt transient voltage spikes while connected to an industrial circuit that is capable of releasing a large amount of energy in the event of a fault. If a meter arcs or shorts out internally while connected to a circuit with a lot of energy potential, things can go very bad very fast. I know most people wouldn't buy a cheap meter like this to test commercial and industrial power systems, and for what I'm going to do, testing amperage with the clamp function of these meters, the input protection of the test lead jacks won't come into play at all. But I still think it's worth talking about because it's absolutely possible that meters like this will end up in the hands of someone who is relying on the CAT rating. The thing is, organizations come up with the ratings and test methodology for those ratings, but there's nothing forcing a manufacturer to follow them. A company can self-certify that a meter meets a certain rating. In other words, they can just say it. Sure, they may be doing the testing themselves, but maybe not. There's no regulation to stop a company from printing whatever rating they want on a meter. Trust me, bro, <laughs> applies here. I don't have a transient surge generator that can generate six to 8,000 volt transients with a two ohm source impedance. But after looking inside these meters, I'm still pretty convinced that most of the cheap ones would not pass the proper testing. The basics for input protection are some method of voltage surge suppression, some way to limit current, and enough separation and isolation of the input circuits to ensure that nothing arcs out internally. Those things are relatively easy to look for. Here is the inside of a 600 volt CAT3 rated fluke meter. It's one of the cheapest flukes available actually. It uses MOVs or MOVs for voltage surge suppression. MOVs work by clamping or going low resistance if voltage gets above a certain level. This provides a path to ground, hopefully shunting the voltage spike away from sensitive components so it doesn't blow them up or simply arc out somewhere. Arcs can get a bit explodey, it's best to avoid those but a huge surge of current is no good either. So most meters use PTC thermistors, which is what this is here, to limit surge current. They heat up when current flows through them and the resistance to current flow goes up with temperature. Thermistors can't heat up instantaneously, so some meters, like this Fluke, use an additional uh, high wattage resistor for additional surge suppression to limit inrush current while the thermistor has a chance to heat up. And all of that is for nothing if the line voltage can simply arc out before or within the protection circuits. So proper separation of components is important. It's easier for an arc to travel along a surface than it is for it to jump an air gap. So an additional protection from arcing is often to cut slots in the circuit board between components. This fluke does that, but it goes even further by putting uh, molded plastic shields on the case that protrude up through the slots to provide additional isolation as like a barrier. Here are Ideal and Klein brand amp clamps. Both claim 600 volt CAT3 ratings. It isn't as thorough, but they have made some effort to separate and isolate the input components. And they do both have thermistors and MOVs. I can't say for sure if they'd pass the 600 volt transient testing with a two ohm source impedance to officially meet the 600 volt CAT3 rating but they do at least have voltage surge suppression and current limiting components, and they have made some effort, even if they didn't go to the lengths of some others. Here is a relatively inexpensive Unity meter. It's also very compact. <laughs> it's rated 300 volts CAT3 
and 600 volts CAT2, so it is rated slightly lower than the others so far. Inside, you can see thermistors with an isolation slot cut in the board between them to prevent arcing across them, and MOVs for voltage surge suppression. There's also a reasonable separation of the input circuits, so yeah, overall not bad. Here is a cobalt meter from Lowe's that was just $22 in a kit with other things. It also claims 600 volt CAT3. Inside, you can see the HRC fuses for the current measurement modes, and it also has thermistors and MOVs, and you can even see little slots cut in the board between the MOVs for extra, you know, arc protection. There's definitely been some effort made, and it's not a bad showing for such a cheap meter. It's not a clamp meter, but I wanted to show that an effort could be made, even if the meter was pretty cheap. Here are the first two cheap amp clamp meters that I picked up on Amazon. The brands are Kaiweets and Mayalon. Both were around $25 on sale, and they turned out to be virtually identical inside. Both of them are supposedly rated 600 volt CAT3, and when I opened them up, I saw an unpopulated spot for an MOV on the board. It turns out, it's a good thing it's not there. <laughs> the pads for the non-existent MOV are connected directly to the input terminals on these meters, with nothing to limit current. So if there was a MOV there, it would basically be a tiny bomb waiting for a voltage spike to push the detonator. The first time a voltage spike caused that MOV to clamp down, it would just become a direct short across the input terminals with nothing to limit current. Bang. So there's no voltage surge suppression in these meters, and also in one of the meters, the two terminals for one of the PTCs are bent almost to the point of touching, and there is a little blob of solder that is about halfway to shorting out uh, this five mega ohm resistor. These resistors, by the way, have the input here on this resistor, and then it goes through in series, and then the output is here. So there's only maybe two to three millimeters between these two pads, which is the only distance needed to arc past and bypass both of those <laughs> resistors. So in general, in addition to having no voltage surge suppression, they have pretty poor isolation of the input circuits. And in case you thought that it was just that those meters were super cheap, nope, Kaiweets just doesn't care. Here is a different model Kaiweets meter that is actually $80 to $90, and it is supposedly rated at 1,000 volt CAT3, which means it should be able to handle up to 1,000 volts continuous and 8,000 volt spikes. It's built just like the cheaper meter, right down to the unpopulated spot for the MOV on the input terminals. And also the two 5 mega ohm input resistors with the pads just maybe two millimeters apart, which is all it would take to jump past these. And that's in addition to, of course, just having no voltage surge suppression at all, and the two pads for this non-existent MOV are connected directly to the input terminals, and they're actually less than 10 millimeters apart, so that too is just another potential path for an arc inside this supposedly 1000 volt CAT3 rated meter. Next is the Mestec, which has 600 volt CAT3 printed on it. Once again, we have a thermistor, but no voltage surge suppression components. There's a bit better isolation and separation in this meter than there are in some of the others, but we still do have just direct input traces and pads pretty close to other components on the board. Not a huge gap there. Also, this screw is literally screwed down against <laughs> this trace, which is connected directly to the input side and the output side of this PTC runs on a trace on the back side of the board right next to this screw. So all the, all the input voltage would have to do is arc through this little bit of solder mask to this screw and then to that trace on the back and it would completely bypass the, the thermistor, which is you know the only current limiting on this board. And again, nothing really to uh, suppress voltage spikes. So but at least these two input resistors are in a line rather than right next to each other. Next is a Binta, which claims 600 volt CAT3. Once again, no MOVs or other devices to suppress voltage spikes. I'm sensing a trend. It also has poor isolation in general. The battery positive pad is right next to the voltage input terminal. Uh, in full input power passes through a via in the board right about here and it then runs along the underside of the board to the thermistor up here, and it runs right next to other traces on the board. 
That trace also runs right next to the display connector on the other side of the board. In fact, input power is right next to the display pad in several of these cheap meters. This Proster clamp meter claims to be 600 volt CAT2 and 300 volt CAT3. And just FYI, that rating should mean that the meter is able to withstand voltage transients of 4,000 volts from a 2 ohm source. And yet, no MOV or other device to suppress transient voltage spikes in this meter. Input voltage actually passes through the board and comes up to this side of the thermistor, but there's actually a little trace on the board that comes from the other side of the thermistor and right up to a point about here, so it, it ends up being really close to the input side of that thermistor, so just kind of begging to arc across that. There are also several other traces on the board that run from the input voltage, and they run right next to other traces, right next to the display contact pad, so it, you know, really not very good isolation, and nothing to suppress surges. Finally, I just wanted to show that meters with questionable ratings don't only come from the internet. I picked up this supposedly 600 volt CAT3 rated meter at a local hardware. There's no voltage surge suppression and pretty poor isolation of all the input circuitry in general. But I have a battery in it for a reason. The 9 volt battery that powers this meter has a metal shell. The plastic for the battery compartment doesn't overlap when the case is installed. So essentially you have a metal battery shell, you know, just that far away from the two input terminals that, you know, could have 600 volts on them plus, you know, up to 6,000 volt transient spike. Again, kind of questionable and I got this at a local hardware store. Side note, but I also think it's pretty funny that this entire section of the board is unpopulated. So tons of spots for resistors, capacitors, some type of integrated circuit, another large capacitor and just nothing there no resistor there a bunch of spots for resistors here but nothing there eh, kind of interesting after all of that you can decide if the companies selling these cheap meters are even remotely telling the truth about the voltage category rating that is printed on them granted the voltage category ratings don't necessarily mean that the meter would survive a high voltage transient they just mean that you would <laughs> so if a meter did fail it wouldn't be in such a way that you were to get shocked or hurt so eh, who knows maybe none of this matters for your use case but i thought it was worth showing that the input protection of the more generic branded cheap meters falls way behind where i think it should be given the ratings they put on them which is also why i wanted to point out that those ratings are only as good as the word of the company that prints them there there's no regulation around it so just be careful out there let's get to actually testing the meters I don't have calibrated loads to verify the exact accuracy of these meters, and I'm not too worried about a couple percent difference here and there. What I'm more curious about is how well each of these meters will handle the rather noisy amperage of a welder, and if there are any that are obviously way off. I have a Hioki clamp meter here with similar or better basic accuracy specs than anything else here. And it's within the one year guaranteed accuracy time frame since it has been calibrated by Hioki. So theoretically, it should still be within spec. I will have that meter set up as well for every test. I will also be using a welder that shows amperage while welding. Even if the welder display isn't 100% accurate, it at least gives us a consistent point of comparison between all the meters, along with the Hioki. And with that, let's get started. The first group of meters all read pretty close. My old Amprobe reads an amp or two lower than the rest, but it's probably within its accuracy spec because it's not that far off. The readings on some jump around a bit more than others, but at both 60 amps and 140 amps, all of these meters read within a few amps of each other and the meter on the welder. The triplet meter read a bit high when running at 140 amps. I didn't realize it was reading quite as high as it was, or I'd have included it in the 220 amp testing that I do later. The ideal and Klein meters read a few amps high, but overall pretty stable and not too far off. The Proster meter doesn't zero very well. When I zero the amps in DC, it does initially zero, but the reading immediately starts climbing back up, even with no current flowing. In terms of the actual amperage readings, the Proster reads a bit low, 
but as a percentage, it's not as far off as most of the other cheap meters. Even at just 60 amps, the Binta, the Mestec, and all three Kiwitz meters were reading 5 to 6 amps high, and a couple of them were as much as 10 or more amps high for short periods. At 140 amps, they read over 10 amps high, with the Binta and the Mestec bouncing to almost 20 amps high. So I decided to move up to 160 amps to see if that would make a difference. The Kiwitz meters still read around 10 to 12 amps high, with the Mestec and the Binta bouncing around 15 to 20 amps high. I went back and tested some of the other meters at 160 amps to see how they would do. Turns out I was welding over a bit of slag on my scrap piece, and I didn't realize until later that it was causing the amperage to jump around. So the output for this test wasn't as stable, but you can still see that the Fluke and the Unity read pretty well, with the triplet reading about 5 or 6 amps high. And technically that reading is probably still within its spec, because the triplet has the worst basic accuracy spec of any meter here and it's no further off than it was at 140 amps. I decided to switch welders so I could up the amperage to see how the meters that were reading high would do at higher amperage. With the welder set to 220 amps, the three Kiwitz meters all gave pretty much identical readings of about 14 to 15 amps high. Interestingly, the Mestec wasn't quite as far off as it was at lower amperages, but it was still close to 10 amps high, and it jumped to 240 amps for a split second a few times. The Proster continued its trend of reading a bit low, but not being quite as far off overall as the other cheap meters. The Vinta also continued its trend, and it read about 20 amps high. I threw the Ampro bin to this 220 amp test as well, and there was an unfortunate glare on the screen, but it read just a couple amps lower than the welder and the Hioki meter. Again, still surely within its rated spec. I've seen some people use the max recording setting on an amp meter to try to measure max current output on a welder. At one point, I set the Kiwitz and Malon meters into their min max mode and ran a short beat at 140 amps. Not only did both meters read high, one of them peaked around 20 amps higher than the other. With the noisy, peaky load of a welder, using the max recording mode just isn't always a reliable way to measure welder output. So just be aware of the potential for picking up spikes that aren't representative of the normal output when using this mode on the meter. Ultimately, all of these meters technically worked, but some of them are over 10% off in some situations. So if you're considering any of these meters or any other super cheap meter, consider how accurate you need the readings to be. I feel like if a test tool gives me an inaccurate result, it might just take me from not knowing to being confidently wrong. Exact accuracy isn't always critical, so just keep it in mind if you are looking for a cheap meter. Either way, hopefully this was helpful and maybe I'll try a couple of these meters on a MIG welder later too, just to see if the kind of noise profile of a MIG welder affects the readings in any way differently than a stick welder does. And I may end up giving some of these meters away after that video, so be on the lookout for that. In the meantime, if you have any questions or if there's anything else you want me to test out with any of these cheap meters, let me know. And as always, thanks for watching. Take care.